How does the church do next? Is everything going to stay perfect? That's what we're going to talk today about in X5. Well, so far, the church is doing well. It's growing. Peter has taken leadership. The other apostles are doing amazing things. They're serving their community and they're serving each other. But as we know, whenever you get a group of people together, things start to fail, probably because we start to fail, right? We're not perfect. We have our own agendas. We have our own psychological insecurities. And the devil is out there saying, okay, fine. I couldn't tempt Jesus. These people, yeah, that'll be easy. So we start off Acts 5 talking about a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. That's a pretty name, Sapphira. And this is very reminiscent of what Barnabas just did. Sold a piece of property and it says, with his wife's knowledge, kept back some of the money of the sale of the land and put it at the feet of the apostles. You could tell that maybe the, it wasn't a competition, but someone brought up the point that whenever you get someone who donates a large amount of money to a project a church is doing, there's always someone else who's like, okay, okay. And either it's because they feel obligated or it's because I'm, I'm, I'm like that guy. I could do a great job. I'm like that couple. I could, I could do something similar. You know, there's some, I would say competition. That's maybe too strong of a word. But what happened is Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and kept back some of the proceeds or the amount of money to yourself? You, know, you own this land. You had all the power to do with whatever you wanted to do with it. And was it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have lied, not just to man, you lied to all of us, to God. And when Ananias held this word, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear, it says, came upon everyone who heard this. So think about this in the sense. So basically, the problem is not that he kept money for himself. He could have kept money for him. He could have sold it and kept everything for himself. Not a sin, not a problem. But he went to the apostles and like, here it is. Here's every dime I got from this land sale. And it's all for you and for the church and for God. Wasn't true. We're not going to go into whether he fell down and died of his own accord or anything like that. But it, it scared people. Of course it would. Because they're probably unsure if the problem was is that he didn't give everything, maybe not even thinking about the fact that they lied. And so they did. The young men rose up and they carried him out to bury him. Then about three hours later, his wife comes back. She didn't know what happened. And Peter says, tell me, when you sold the land, was it for that amount of money? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. He says, you know, how is it that you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold. The feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out too. And she fell down and breathed her last. And the young men came in and carried her out to be buried with her husband. And it says, yeah, great fear came upon the whole church, and everyone had heard these things. Now, people wonder, was it so bad he kept some of the money for himself? And again, the problem is the lie. It wasn't keeping money for himself. They had the opportunity to admit, and they didn't do it. They continued to look someone in the eye and lie to them. That's serious. And I think God does take lies in general very seriously because you're presenting two faces, right? The action itself shows there's something not right. But here's the other big point to keep in mind. When we're Christians and we believe in the afterlife, death is not the end all, right? The worst thing, you know, God says, fear those who can keep you from heaven, you know, who can, who can take down the soul. That's what you should be afraid of. You shouldn't be afraid of those who can inflict pain on your body. They died. Sure. Is that pretty severe? Absolutely. Is what they did about lying? Absolutely. Also bad. I don't think this means they're not in heaven. I don't see any sign of that. It didn't say anything to that extent. And again, don't be afraid of those who can harm the body. Be afraid of those who can harm the soul. They were on a bad path. Now their soul intact, unharmed. Then 
it says that many signs and wonders were done by the people and by the hands of the apostles. And so they're standing there at the temple. It says Solomon's portico. They, but they held him in high esteem. And even more believers were added. Many men and women, you know, came to God. Some of them carried their sick and put them out on the street, hoping that Peter's shadow might fall on them. Then people gathered in the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick. And it says those afflicted with the unclean spirits. Those can be the demon-possessed people. Everyone was healed. We're going to get back into this again. But Peter's shadow does not heal people. Peter doesn't heal people. Peter's clothes don't heal people. Peter's made it quite clear that healing and everything comes from Jesus. And it's the same thing when people reached out to touch Jesus, when the woman who had the bleeding disorder reached out and touched the tassels of his robe, was healed. There's no such thing as healing robes, tassels, pieces of cloth, not not at all. Instead, this is because Jesus can heal people, has the desire to heal people as a completion of their faith. So again, people get the wrong idea, and I think they get the wrong idea here. And the Bible reports it. I mean, the people say, oh, well, the Bible's 100% true. It doesn't mean that everyone's opinion in the Bible is 100% true. It means that what happened was truthful and God-breathed. And in this case, I think the people had it wrong. So again, the apostles were arrested, the high priest rose up, and they were with the party of the Sadducees, and they were jealous. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. It's interesting because if you had someone who could heal, like I said, someone with cancer or someone with something big, you would want more of that. You would want people's pain to be relieved. And in this case, it wasn't at all that they were happy for the people getting healed. They, it, they were jealous. They were angry it wasn't them. And again, I think they thought, Once we put Jesus to death, this whole thing goes away. That's why they were so desperate to do it. And now they're seeing this is not going away. They're in prison and this is in the night. And an angel opens the door and says, hey, go out into the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And so when they heard this, they went out to the temple at daybreak and began to teach again. And the high priest came by, like, you know, they're walking to work, they have their coffee, and then they're like, well, aren't those the ones we just put in prison? Why are they all standing out there? So they bring the officer out, and he says, you know what? We found the prison, all the doors were locked, everything was intact, and here they are. It's very perplexing, it's very confusing. So then the captains with the officers went and brought them back in, not by fours, not by you know, stoning them or doing something drastic because they were afraid of the people. We're always afraid of those people, right? And they bring them before the council and the high priest questions them. We told you not to do this and now you're doing this and you're preaching in that man's name. I can't even say it. And Peter says, you know what? We have to obey men, not God. And saying, you're telling Jerusalem with your teachings, true, that you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Well, if you're talking about the healing blood of Jesus that we get at communion, maybe so. And Peter says, you know, we have to obey God, not men. God of our fathers, you know, and that's going to mean something to the Jewish structure. Our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, raised Jesus, whom you killed, hanging him on a tree, wood, right? Cross made out of wood, and God exalted him. Now he's sitting at the right hander as leader and savior, to give repentance to Israel, all of you, and the forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses to these things. And so whom the Holy Spirit has God given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were mad and they wanted to kill him. But one of the Pharisees in the council named Gamaliel, this guy is famous. He he has famous writings. He has famous words. We know some of his words. We think he was mentioned in the movie Yentl. I mean, we know this guy. And what's not only interesting about that is his grandfather was Hillel. So if you ever see Hillel houses, particularly near campus, I tried to stay at a Hillel house when I was in Jerusalem. And this is how I ended up at the convent. They saw my name and it's a very Irish name. And they're like, you're Jewish? The only people who are staying here are Jewish. And I said, I am Jewish because my mom is Jewish. My dad, who I get my name from, not Jewish. But 
I recited some of my bat mitzvah. I said some of the prayers I knew, like the Shema. I said, dudes, I can read Hebrew. I did not say dudes, but dudes, I can read Hebrew. I am Jewish. And then I walked right out. And I thought, well, okay, now where am I going to stay? Well, my friends who were going to be in Jerusalem that night were staying at the convent. And because they weren't Jewish at all. Guess what? I'm staying at the convent now, too, where I got to meet the nuns. I got to see all the things that Jesus did and all the places he walked. Boy, you know, like I said, I feel now in doing this that God's hand was on me all the way. Thinking from the beginning of my life, but really in that trip to Israel that I spent the summer there. Now I'm staying at the convent instead of Hillel House. But anyway, his grandfather was Hillel. He has very famous quotes that say something like, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah, right? We, we recognize Jesus' sentiment in all of that. And the quote, which is also very famous, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? And if I'm not being my own self, what am I? And if not now, when? People have divided that quote up into a billion different uh, pieces and quotes from it. Talks about separating yourself from the community. Whoever destroys one soul, it is as though he has destroyed the entire world, which I think we also quote nowadays. So Hillel, very famous, and his grandson, Gamaliel, also very famous. And so he said a really interesting thing. He said, look, he say, look, why do you care about what these men are doing? You know, there's another guy named Thutis, who was also claiming to be somebody. And 400 men followed him. And then he died. He was actually put to death by the Romans. They took him back. They cut off his head. It was dramatic. And guess what? Those 400 people, they all went away. They all went away. So look, if what they're saying, it, it has truth to it, then everything these guys are trying to do, it'll fail. But if there's God in this, you won't be able to overthrow it anyway, which ended up being true. The church never was overthrown because of the things that the Sadducees, the temple structure did. You might even be found opposing God if you do this. So they took his advice, and when they called the apostles, they beat him, I think, 39 times, charged him not to speak anymore about this Jesus guy, and then they left the president of the council, rejoicing that they were counted to suffer, you know, in the name of Jesus. Every day, it says, in the temple, from house to house, they did not stop teaching, not stop preaching that the Messiah is Jesus. So there goes the lesson. It didn't work very well. But this is what I thought was interesting about Gamaliel, is that he's asking to give it a shot. Look to see what happens. Let's just see what happens next. He had a very moderate, tolerant stance. He was probably a little bit curious what was going to happen next because there's all sorts of stories about him becoming a Christian later on and that supposedly all those gospel stories that talk about what happened inside the room with the Sadducees and inside the room with the temple leadership, how did we know those things happened? How do we know what was said to Jesus? The rumor is, is that he told everybody what happened, or at least that's the idea behind it. Another question to ask when we get to heaven. Is everyone making a list? I should really make a list. There's some that believe he did become a Christian at the end. Who's his disciple? Paul. And it makes me think that when Jesus was talking to the Sadducees, he said something like, you're terrible, but you're making your offspring. Your offspring are even worse, a hundred times worse. I'll have to get the right quote. But you, what you're producing is even worse than what you are. And that makes me think of Paul. Here's some of the people in the Sadducees who were like, hey, let's give this guy a chance. We know that there are people in the Sanhedrin who followed Jesus, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And yet it was producing men like Paul. And we're going to see what Paul does next. The reason that they brought Jesus to Pilate is they had no authority to kill him. And instead, we're going to see some killings and that it does happen from time to time. What I'm going to meditate on this week is that idea of we're not stopping God. Nobody is going to stop God. If this thing is from God, it may look like a temporary defeat. You know, we have seen places where there's a church and 
the church is wiped out by radicals living in the area and they kill everybody in the church. And it looks, and it is, a defeat. It's not permanent. It's not forever. And so in the end, I think he is right. If something is with God behind it, it, one, will not fail. And two, if you act against it, you are acting against God. But I think in the bigger picture things, there are many times when we see defeat, we see anguish, we see pain, and we see suffering. But in the end, it's always God who's going to succeed and win the day. It's always going to be God who is going to get his goals and do the things he wants to do. What I'm going to pray about is the fact that we have that attitude, that when we see things go wrong, when we have defeats or we see defeats in the world, it, it's heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. But to have that attitude that when God is behind it, it's going to come out victorious in the very end of things. And that when Peter and the apostles are told, stop teaching in the temple and quit saying that guy's name. Instead, they did it every day and they did it house to house, temple to temple. And it says, because they have to obey God, not men. I pray to have that kind of strength. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that the apostles stood firm, whether they were being arrested, whether they were talking in the temple area, whether they were confronted by the council. Their hearts, where they ran away just weeks ago, are now rock solid. And that I'm going to share with other people, don't feel frail with the word of God or with God behind you or when doing God's mission, but stand strong like the apostles did in this particular time. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, tell a friend, tell somebody about this podcast. Maybe they would be interested in starting out with Acts with us and hearing more. We are going to go through the whole Bible and see what happens next. All right, everyone, have a wonderful day.